James Carville has joined the elite, the small cadre of people who are so bat guano crazy that they no longer deserve to exit the nursing home. But like a lion dog faced pony soldier, he did, and when he did, he appeared on Bill's Mars show. And on that appearance, he told us that Christian nationalists are a bigger threat to America than even Al Qaeda. Mike Johnson and what he believes is one of the greatest threats we have today to the United States. When I'm talking about I the promise you, I know these people. Well, you're talking about Christian nationalism. That's what absolutely. I was talking about this, at the is, end. this is a right. this is a, a bigger <clears throat> threat than Al Qaeda. Religious bigotry for 300, Alex. Well, the game is afoot. Now. As Christians, we are used to the double standard in the media, how Islamophobia is a thing and homophobia is a thing, and there's all sorts of phobias, but oddly not a phobia against Christians in Christianity, which is on full display here. Now, let's push aside that for a moment, and we'll get to what the actual definition of Christian nationalism is, since we don't get any of that benefit from listening to James Carville, merely baseless accusations. Let's push aside his Skeletor-like appearance and the fact that he's wearing a Pride Marine hoodie or what seems to be something like that. And let's just look at the claim. We don't have the benefit of any real evidence being brought to the fore, but I will try to do that for you now to see if there's any meat to the claim that Christian nationalism is the greatest threat facing America right now. So his contention is that Mike Johnson wrote a forward to a book called The Revivalist Manifesto by Scott McKay. And because that forward is an implicit endorsement that somehow this makes Mike Johnson a right-wing extremist. No, not the people who chop off the body parts of children. They're not the extremists. No, Christians are the extremists. And why? Well, I will give you uh, a left-wing article illustrating a hit list of all of the biggest problems with the Revivalist Manifesto, and then you can judge for yourself. So here's a Vanity Fair article illuminating and illustrating for us all of the issues with this book. So this is the best of the best, the top 10 worst things going on in this book. And this is what they have to say. First and foremost, Scott McKay says that poor voters are unsophisticated and susceptible to government dependency and easy to manipulate with Black Lives Matter, defunding the police, pandering. How sophisticated is the homeless population? And do they depend upon the government? And is there a group of people in the government that are far more likely to endorse a large social safety net, a large welfare program that then may potentially manipulate the voting of people? So does free money manipulate the way people vote? Probably. Here's the next accusation. It describes Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg as the queer choice for the cabinet job, calls him openly and obnoxiously gay, and refers to him as gay Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Again, you'll have to judge for yourself, but is a one-term mayor of South Bend, Indiana, really qualified to be the Transportation Secretary? And as far as him being obnoxious, well, I'll just let this speak for itself. The Republican Party likes to cloak itself in the language of religion. Okay, maybe I won't let it speak for itself. Your powers of gayness don't give you the ability, the supernatural ability to be able to castigate and hate on a whole group of religious people, something you would never do to Muslims. Furthermore, the book goes on and it says this. It claims that the Biden administration purposefully let undocumented immigrants into the U.S. for voting purposes. Now, is that really the reason why? We're only left to speculate, but they certainly are letting record numbers of immigrants into the country. And the left wing of the party is the party that wants to try to nationalize all these people who snuck into the country illegally. Now, by the way, we have James Carville on Bill Maher's show later going on to say this. If you want to sneak into the country illegally, come on, baby, I got a job for you. Um, there are tons of homeless people in America that potentially deserve your attention if you really want to hand out jobs to people. We don't necessarily need to let illegal immigrants sneak into the country with who knows what kind of agenda and motivation uh, when we could be trying to truly help out people who are in desperate need of help. Uh, right now. Now, I'm not saying that means that we don't have a border policy that allows for refugees and immigrants to come to the country who could benefit from America. All I am saying is simply this, is that uh, I don't think this guy actually cares about immigrants as much as he cares about open borders. 
And then the book will go on to claim things like Barack Obama's chief selling point was that he was black. Well, you just tell me, prior to Barack Obama coming onto the scene, did he have any qualifications that you were aware of? The book goes on and it says, the Pizzagate scandal was born and though some of the most outlandish allegations made in it were clearly disproven, other elements were not. The whole thing just seemed to be dismissed as debunked and no explanation was ever given. Now, this is probably the most broad-based and easy to attack uh, accusation because I don't really get from this exactly what allegations were made that were true, but he does go to the effort of saying that most of the allegations were clearly disproven and they were not true. He seems to simply be suggesting something that, again, you'll have to think for yourself on this one, but let's just see if this suggestion bears up with scrutiny. He seems to be suggesting that the media is far too quick to disprove things that don't benefit the Democratic Party. And even when some of these quote unquote conspiracy theories have some meat to them, maybe kind of like lab leak theories and that kind of thing, the media is far too quick to push them aside without any care of the actual evidence that is really before them. Uh, so you decide for yourself whether or not you believe the media is a bunch of lying sack of whatever. All right, the book will go on and, and it will say things like it suggests that Supreme Court Ch Chief Justice John Roberts has ties to sex trafficker Jer Jeffrey Epstein. I don't know, guys. I don't know if he does or not. I can only tell you this, that the Jeffrey Epstein story should still cause a lot of suspicion for you. And if you don't know by now, Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself. So as I said, you decide for yourself. Does that make Mike Johnson a conspiracy theorist because he forwarded a book that claims that the left in America today loves identity politics, uh, the media is far too quick to step away from stories that might actually have evidence to them, and that the left loves border policies and that Pete Buttigieg is officially obnoxious. All of those things perfectly seem in bounds to me. So let's go and just test out the claim about Christian nationalism. Is it something that even exists in America? Are Christians Christian nationalists, or is there even a subsection of the Christian community that believes in Christian nationalism? Let's assume for a moment that what James Carville means is that we want to create a theocratic fascist dictatorship in America where everybody is either forcibly going to be Christian or they will be excommunicado, kicked out of the country. Well, let's number the amount of Christians who actually believe that that's what we should do to this country. Or are we merely talking about a much larger subsection of people who believe that this country, rightfully so, was founded upon Christian principles? You know, that whole, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that we are given inalienable rights from our creator. Well, what creator might that be? Might that come from the Judeo-Christian tradition in the West that produced this society and other societies in the West? Is there a group of Christians who believe that obvious historical fact? Yes. Nonetheless, let's dig into a Pew Research poll that actually gives us some information that will be helpful to us in discerning whether or not there is such a thing as a Christian nationalist who believes that everybody should be forcibly um, converted to, to Christianity. In a Pew Research poll, U.S. adults were asked about the country, and the vast majority of them said that, yes, this country was founded on Christian principles. Now, when that question was dug into a little bit more, here's what they had to say. Of those polled, and I won't say that the people polled here were Christians. I will only tell you that the vast majority of them said that America is a Christian nation. And here's what they had to say. 60% said America was originally a Christian nation. 51% said that it should be a Christian nation still. So the majority of people believe that it was and should be a Christian nation. Well, then what do they mean by that? 83% said of these same people polled, judges should not bring their own biases into major court cases. 77% said churches should not endorse a political candidate. And 67% said churches should stay out of political matters altogether. So since we cannot actually find a single Christian, really, that believes that we should kick all non-Christians out of the country, let's just assume that Christian nationalism is a left-wing conspiracy theory likened unto QAnon.
And what does Carville really mean then when he says Christian nationalism is the biggest threat facing America today? He just means this, I hate Christians. That's what he really means. Him and other leftists like him hate Christianity and they hate how influential it is. They hate how good it is because truly deep down, they are not. So here's my suggestion. Instead of name calling, let's talk facts. The real culprit destroying America has nothing to do with Christianity. All Carville is doing here is rehashing a tactic that the left loves to use. And we saw it in the summer of 2020. If you want to attack something you hate, you simply label it. You call it racist. Now, the people using racism as a weapon don't really care about the diminishing of actual racism and how that hurts actual racism. They simply hate the people they label and they know if they label them effectively enough, they can manipulate and control those people. But not if you say the people who are using these labels are full of crap. If we evade those kind of emotional blackmail tactics, we can clearly see that the real problem in America today is not Christian nationalism, it's atheist globalism. And you don't have to look hard to see this. Look, if I even give you January 6th and say that is one of the worst days in recent memory in American history, um, which I don't believe, but if I gave that to you, you still wouldn't be able to say that it is Christians destroying this nation. More importantly, even with January 6th in mind, if you look at all the things really impacting this nation, a big top 10 list, let's say, of the things really impacting America, you'd have to come to a much different conclusion about who is really behind the things impacting America in a negative way. And so my top 10 list would sound something like this. The top 10 things facing America are fatherlessness, the economy, the border, which I just saw the other day that 26,000 Chinese immigrants have come in through our southern border. Does that strike anybody as very strange? Another thing that's impacting America is sexual identity confusion found in the LGBTQ cult, the failure of educational institutions, race peddling leading to mass rioting and looting. Did you know that they just banned ski masks in Philadelphia because there's so much stealing going on in that city? I would also say identity politics and then our political class. I would also say abortion, which by the way, if you believe life starts at conception, you know, the creation of brand new original DNA that never existed before, then you might realize that that is the number one killer of children in America and you might want to do something about it. And then finally, I would say this, religious bigotry leading to making America a spiritual wasteland. And honest atheists are going to have to wake up one day and say, damn, maybe I shouldn't have blindly hated on something I really didn't understand when they realize that the kind of communist atheism that many want in America is really bad for America. All that to say this, you can disagree with my list, but name the things that are Christian that are really wrong with this nation. If you can't find much, you may have to realize that Carville is full of more than crap. And that evil may be the very kind of thing that puts innocent people in gas chambers for the crime of believing in a religion that loves your neighbor and turns the other cheek. If you're so satanic that you can demonize that kind of person for that kind of thing, then you deserve more than a nursing home. If any part of you agrees that Christian nationalism may be a very dangerous term to throw around, especially when religion has always played a role in every civilization known to mankind, not to mention Christianity has played a role in America, it might be time for you to see past your religious bigotry and see the good in Christianity and embrace it rather than being a mindless bigot. We'll talk about that and more today on Indie Thinker. Welcome to the show. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And don't forget your end of year giving has a perfect home at Indie Thinker. If you want to give a Christmas gift to the channel and you want to help this podcast continue to thrive and create more content in the future. And trust me, guys, we've got some great things planned for you. Not only do we continue to produce guest shows, not only will we also have future episodes of podcasts to the church, something that I really look forward to doing. We've got some great guests to roll out in the future, but, but also we've got some great documentary content coming and even more than that. If you want to see this channel continue to grow and produce the kind of content that can help people think critically about the issues that matter most, then we highly encourage you to consider giving a tax deductible donation to IndieThinker. You can do that by going going to the description of this podcast or the link on the screen right now. 
give and give generously and know that it's going to a great cause. If this show has ever been beneficial to you whatsoever in the past, then please consider giving a tax deductible donation today. A question has plagued the mind of Christians for a long time, at least if you think about things on a regular basis, which I highly encourage, very beneficial. And one question that we've been asking ourselves, especially as the culture continues to shift left, and we have been asking, especially as we continue to push babies through abortion mills in places like Planned Parenthood, the question is, can a Democrat be a Christian or can a Christian be a Democrat? And I'm gonna give you a short answer to this, but then also explain in much longer fashion. And the simple answer is yes, provisionally. A Christian can be a Democrat if, among other things, they are pro-life. Now I use that just because I think that's probably the major one on the list that we need to address right here. Because you can't actively go around murdering people and consider yourself a Christian. It's just kind of the way it goes. Now some of you may even have a question about this because you'd say, Reed, as a Christian evangelical, you believe that salvation is a gift from God that is brought about by faith and not by work. So how can you say the work of, of believing in abortion is something that discredits your Christian faith? Well, of course, because that verse of scripture has just been horribly misinterpreted by you if that's the kind of thing that you believe. Of course, it is not talking about works like gross immoral acts. That kind of stuff, no disciple, no apostle, no person in the Bible would ever say, yeah, you're still a Christian if you can do those kind of things. When, when the Bible says in Romans that it is not works that saves us, what it means, it's not the works of the law, not rabbinic Judaism that saves us. It is the salvation that comes from Christ that produces a new nature in people. And by the way, that is one of the things that separates Christianity from the pack, certainly among the three major religions of the world. Christianity teaches that you're not just putting your faith in something that will help you develop good morals. You're putting your faith in something that can actually change your nature. Your inner man can change your soul. That's the power of Christianity. And it's all that much more important as we see our society continually morally degrading. Now, I think a perfect example of this is what just happened on the debate stage between Ron DeSantis and Gavin Newsom. How, you might ask? Well, here's how. Ultimately, my takeaway from the debate between Newsom and DeSantis is that these, this conversation was a little bit like a blast from the past of conversations of old, and our political game doesn't seem to be really in that place anymore, certainly since Barack Obama and certainly since Donald Trump. It, it seems to be that the conversations that were had by Newsom and DeSantis are no longer really had in our political class. And that might be a bad thing. To give you kind of a flavor of that, here's just a couple of clips from the night. You These have six up. or seven Here dollar a the, gallon gas. How do, they, how do they afford that? These are folks that are blue collar people. You were talking You're about gonna tax force everybody to buy an electric state. vehicle. No. How are they gonna be able to afford electric vehicles? I don't like the way you demean people. I don't like the way you demean the LGBTQ community. I don't like the way you demean and humiliate people you disagree with, Ron. You have the freedom to defecate in public in California. You have the freedom to pitch a tent on Sunset Boulevard. You have the freedom to create a homeless encampment under a freeway and even light it on fire. You have the, the freedom to uh, have an open air drug market and use drugs. He thinks Biden and Harris have done a great job. He thinks the economy is working because of their policies for Americans, and they are not. And so what California represents is the Biden-Harris agenda on steroids. So this is a book that's in some of the schools in California, Florida, this is not consistent with our standards, called Gender Queer. I, it's, some of it's blacked out. You would not probably be able to put this on air. This is pornography. This is a ginned up, made up issue to divide this country. You talk about dividing this country, this is part of the culture war, the weaponization of grievance. This is part okay. using education. Well, We're focusing on math, science. We're focusing on reimagining our school We're gonna system. We're going to get to education He's criminalizing next. teachers so, and criminalizing librarians. They the the check out they the wrong the book. You have had more kids locked out of school for a longer period of time in California than anywhere else in the country. It was the working class kids. It was the middle income kids. His kids were in private school. They were in class. We have one of the best records under COVID, during COVID. Ultimately, my takeaway from this whole conversation, and maybe you saw it in these clips, is just simply that 
One of these people on the debate stage, DeSantis, was interested in giving facts. And Newsom, when confronted with facts from the CDC and other places, continually undermined those facts and just dismissed them by waving his hand saying that's not true, even though they had the evidence right in front of them. Now, this is the way, in my mind, debates in the past really went. You had Republicans trying to tell the truth while debating somebody who was actively lying and just resisting the facts that were right in front of their face. Now, unfortunately, though this is the debate perhaps that we should have had in America, and we should be able to appreciate truth tellers regardless of political affiliation, we're not really there as a society anymore. And this is where we go back to my original question, can a Christian be a Democrat? Why? Because what we need is a revival of sorts to try to help awaken our conscience in America. Because where we are today, whether you like this or not, is just simply that the debate between Newsom and DeSantis really wasn't entertaining enough. Maybe I missed something, but on social media, and I try to stay pretty up to date with things, I really didn't see any viral clips coming from that debate other than when two theatrical thing ha things happen. And that's when uh, DeSantis pulled out a picture of the poop in San Francisco and pulled out a picture from the book Gender Queer, which was in libraries and schools in California. So those were the only kind of clips that made it around the, the internet simply because our society today is in love with viral clips. They're in love with clickbait. They're not necessarily in love with truth because if you are, I think there's really only one clear choice here. If you're in love with truth, you're not interested necessarily in the theatricality that comes associated with Donald Trump. Look, I get it. It's fun and it is a break from what we are used to in the past. I totally get that. But I think that is the point at the end of the day. The reason most people could care less about the Newsom DeSantis debate was simply because our society has moved on to the point where we realize that what has taken place in the past has really not produced anything of value. This is why so many people left and right don't really appreciate the government anymore and have a lot of contempt for the government. In fact, I think that's the number one reason why people like Trump. I think when he was in office, he did some good things. But more importantly, and originally, the reason why Trump was placed in office in the first place is because the American people have such contempt for the government. As I heard uh, Norman Lear say, who is a famous producer in Hollywood, he said that Trump is the giant middle finger to the political class. And that's exactly right. He was a middle finger on behalf of regular people being pointed directly at politicians because we think it's so ridiculous. And that's why so many people look at the debate between Newsom and DeSantis and associate it with being just old school kind of politics, establishment politics. I'm not really sure that it was because at the end of the day, if we can think a little bit more clearly beyond our contempt for government and beyond our desire to push away from simply the past, we can realize that what we desperately need is we need a candidate who tells the truth because we have an American public today that really can't tell right from wrong, fact from fiction anymore. They're far more inclined to vote entertainment before they ever vote for truth. But that's a reminder of something. Conservatism isn't enough to really help people, regular average Americans really appreciate truth. We need to go beyond that. And that's where I think Christianity truly plays a part. And this goes back again to the question about Christians and Democrats. Christianity teaches a renewed nature, a nature that will appreciate the truth when confronted with lies. And it doesn't mean that Christians get this right all the time. I'm just simply saying this, that because Christianity has an emphasis upon objective truth and cares about the truth, even if you don't agree with the objective truths that we come up with, there is, it is undeniable that Christianity is a historic religion based upon historical truth, and we care about the objective reality of those things. And if we do, then it might be a great defense for a political candidate who actually tells the truth, which is really what America needs now more than ever. And speaking of personality, the next story I want to go through is how George Santos was just recently expelled from the House. Here's that. This year in Congress appears to be a lock for the history books. It began with a headlock during the unprecedented 15 round vote to elect a U.S. House Speaker. It continued with months of gridlock and the first ever ouster of a U.S. House Speaker. And then there were all the deadlocks. Twice 
flirting with shutdowns of the federal government. And it ends with a change in the door locks of former New York Congressman George Santos, only the third U.S. House member since the Civil War to be expelled. He's pleaded not guilty to fraud, conspiracy, and fleecing his campaign donors. I asked one of Santos's fellow New York House Republicans if the booting of Santos would cool or aggravate the tensions that have boiled over throughout this year in this Congress. And he responded, we'll see. Maybe you got the flavor of that clip. Essentially, it sure seems that the media is once again trying to blame Republicans for basically everything. I mean, you need somebody to act as the scapegoat when you are destroying everything that you possibly can. But the idea is this, is that uh, the Republican House is in disarray. They just got rid of their speaker and they got a new guy. And we don't know about that guy because he actually reads the Bible and things. And then you got Kevin McCarthy elbowing a dude and now they're expelling another fellow Republican. It's just total disarray everywhere. And Republicans are all to blame. Well, I want to make an argument, and that argument is simply this, that I don't believe that Santos was a Republican. And even if he was, the fact that they got rid of him actually is a good thing. Only in a twisted world or in the mind of a Democrat would you be able to come up with the conclusion that when you hold somebody accountable for wrongdoing and for fraud, that actually somehow that's a sign of disarray. It's a sign that things actually are working. But let me go back to the idea that Santos really wasn't a Republican in the first place. So let me go over the reasons for his expulsion and you tell me if those things fall more in line with people on the left or people on the right. So uh, he was expelled for fraud, including stealing card numbers from donors to buy personal items. He even stole money from a veteran. He apparently was involved in raising money to get a dog for a veteran whatever they call those support animals or whatever, for a veteran and apparently took all the money and ran. He was also in trouble for sexual harassment based upon his past of cross-dressing and support for the LGBTQ community. I can only imagine that he sexually harassed a man. And he was known as a cross-dresser, as I mentioned before, and also attended LGBTQ events in the past. He lied about his mother being in the Twin Towers on 9-11. And the funniest one, he used one of his campaign staffers to impersonate Kevin McCarthy so that he could solicit donations. Now that may not be proof positive that he was a Democrat, but I think there's some things glaring out of all of those facts that I just read that, that suggest that he is. But how about this? In the last two issues Santos had to vote for in the month of November, Santos voted present, which is just a way of saying that I'm not going to be yes or no on this thing. I know there's a lot of reasons that you can do it, but essentially if you don't vote in the affirmative, especially on issues that really seem clear cut, then it is typically because you don't want to take a position because you don't believe it is politically expedient. Now, let me tell you what these two issues were. The first one was a bill that was essentially called the No Funds for Iranian Terrorism Act. So no more money for Iran Act. And instead of voting no on that, which you would think if he was a Republican would be pretty clear, he voted present. And he also was asked to vote on the Protecting Communities from Failure to Secure the Border Act, which would give federal funds to those places that are being impacted negatively as a result of the border policy of Biden. And of course, he voted present for that one as well. Again, one that you think would be kind of a no-brainer. Now, I don't know the nuances of that bill, I'll admit, but I can tell you one last thing, that there have been six lawmakers expelled since the history of our republic. And every single one of those outside of Santos was a Democrat. Now you can make the argument that Democrats have just historically been a party that holds people accountable, or you could make this argument, rather that Democrats are the party of slippery and slimy liars that are much more prone to immorality than those who are on the right, which are stereotypically much more religious. Now, this doesn't deny the fact that there are slimy and sleazy Republicans. I get it. There are. It doesn't deny the fact that there are people who claim to be religious that are using it as a tool. I get it. But by and large, especially with a guy like Mike Johnson, the people who claim to be truly faithful religious followers are way less likely to do the kind of things that you see the Democratic Party do on a regular basis and that you just saw Santos do. Not to mention Santos also was elected in New York. Now he did it as a Republican, no doubt, but he also did it with a whole lot of extortion 
and lies. Again, something I would argue largely finds its home more on the left than it does the right, especially in modern society. So my argument is simply this. One party is way more immoral than the other. Republicans lie too, but Democrats do it more often, which I think makes Santos at home in the Democratic Party. And maybe he'll think about running again in their party and they'll be much more protective of him probably in the future. But more importantly, the Christian side of this, the Christian in me wants to just say this to all of you, whether you're a Christian or not. The reality is, is that we have to pick a side when it comes to being moral. We can say that you can't legislate righteousness in society as a Christian, and that's true. You can't make laws that make people righteous, but you can legislate morality. You can make laws that save babies. You can elect Supreme Court justices that overturn Roe v. Wade and saves tens of thousands of lives of babies. You can do that. And if you have the moral courage and bravery to actually take a step back and start illustrating what good morals look like from a biblical perspective, you find out really quickly that there is no moral middle ground on many of these issues, if any of them whatsoever. And once you start illustrating where you really stand on these issues, you'll understand that you are clearly on the right side of the aisle. So you don't want, want to play the semantic game. Okay, I get it. Call yourself whatever you want to call yourself. But if you find that you take a moral position and you consistently find yourself on one side of the aisle and not the other, then you may want to think about actually taking a side. You may want to realize that polarization actually has a purpose in society. It makes ideas and thoughts very clear, and it helps us understand which side we should stand on. The Republicans clearly showed which side they stand on. They stand on the side of truth and they stand on the side of not wanting a guy that continually sexually harasses people and steals money anywhere near them. And I can't help but believe that that makes them morally superior. So yeah, if they have a moral high horse, it might be because they earned it. Nonetheless, let's jump into our final segment, Bible study with Democrats. Oh God of pronouns. I'm going to say something at the beginning of our segment here today that's probably going to trigger some of you atheists. So fair warning, before you run to the comments section, just give me a fair hearing and just calm yourself. Take a chill pill, breath, drink some water, whatever you need to do. But I'm just going to tell you, atheists, those of you who are living on the fart fumes of past atheists like Dawkins, Harris, and Chris Hitchens, you guys are dinosaurs. That old act is tired, weak, and unimpressive. Christians like Bill Craig would stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with those guys, and he was a truly smart man and is a truly smart man. And he gave cosmological arguments, moral arguments, and produced brilliant syllogisms that exposed the fact that atheists had done little of the same kind of thoughtfulness, but Christians have learned their lesson when we engage with people on that level. Many of these atheists in the past were bad faith actors and they didn't care about intellectual rigor. In the past, when weak Christians didn't know how to play offense, they stood back, defended their claim while atheists used people like Hitchens and their spaghetti monster and sky daddy comments to try to act like teenage boys rather than to actually have a substantive argument. Sure, Craig fell into the habit of taking them a little too seriously, but he honestly did some noble work. However, a new crop of apologists are coming up and people are waking up to the incredible delusion of atheism. And they now realize that there is no logical exp explanation for the origin of the universe from atheism. Instead, so desperate are atheists to believe that God doesn't exist that they're willing to posit a blind faith assertion about the origin of the universe like this. And that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. For those listening, that was Dawkins talking about aliens rather than God. So desperate are atheists to prove that God doesn't exist that they will clown themselves to the point of having to admit that they have to steal moral values from Christians. What's your moral code? I suppose it's a version of the golden rule. That was Dawkins again, by the way, stealing moral values from Christians. But no more, we're done. Weak Christians have given way to an all-new crop of believers who refuse to back down to bullies, who try to make up for their flimsy arguments with volume and indignation. Today's viral clip is going to show you exactly why the religion of atheism was destined to fail and why well-known atheists like Matt Dillahunty need to retreat from debates today rather than to hang in there as we look at 
quote unquote blood sport debater Andrew Wilson go toe to toe with Matt Dillahunty. Check it out. Humanism has as its focus the betterment of humanity in this life, while Christianity has as its focus adherence to a God and the disposition of souls in an afterlife. Our best efforts in this life are, according to the Bible, like filthy rags. Our best attempts at righteousness and justice are portrayed as vile and disgusting when compared to a bumbling God constantly failing to get his creation to love and respect him while also prescribing the death penalty for nearly everything, adultery, blasphemy, breaking the Sabbath, disobedient children, witchcraft, worshiping another God, not being a virgin on your wedding night. Which is better for society? Well, I'd say the one that has human society as its focus and isn't so intent on killing humans for not buying into a specific doctrine. Now, I wanted to stop this clip real quick just so that I can say to you, this is going to play into the future of what Matt Delahunty says to Andrew Wilson. He claims here that Christians are basically a bunch of morons for believing what they believe. Oh, and a bunch of hateful bigots, of course. Uh, so he is willing to throw around ad hominem attacks, but uh, watch how precious and sensitive he becomes as Andrew Wilson starts to launch into his position. My name is Andrew Wilson. Um... <clears throat> There's a few ways this debate can go. The topic is Christian ethics versus secular humanism, which, which has a better foundation. The funny thing is, I already won that topic because as Matt explained to Jay Dyer, he has no justification under the skeptical belief structure to give an accounting for any meta-ethical pro, uh, presupposition he may have. He just kind of grants himself stuff. He grants himself logic, he grants himself reason, he grants himself an entire worldview even though he's using an unjustified starting position for it. So. I'm not honestly all that interested in doing the God Not Real Doe debate because one, it's boring, and two, it's also really boring. It goes like this. I don't see enough evidence and remain unconvinced there's a God. Then I say, but you use a theistic worldview of justification like there is a God to grant yourself logic and everything else. So instead of that, I'm just going to grant Matt's entire worldview. Two-thirds or more of, the plan of this entire planet are all operating inside of a shared delusion that they were created by a sky daddy who loves him some slavery and murderousness. You see, human flourishing, the cornerstone of Matt's ideology and that of secular humanism, is totally meaningless. Flourishing by whose metric? From my perspective, for instance, attempting to lie to people who claim men can be women isn't human flourishing. From Matt's perspective, it is. Why? Why should the collective of humanity lie and say men can get pregnant? Homosexuality in society is good for human flourishing, even though they are reproductive dead ends. <laughs> and that Western society and egalitarianism is superior to those evil theist society, even though the Western nations can't even reproduce their own populations, but instead have to replace their population with foreigners from those theist nations that can reproduce. I'm not going to sit here and dignify the preparation that I went through? Oh, well, you've done some great study there, Matt, to make sure that you're ready for this debate. I don't know, Andrew, at all. I don't know what, what version of Christianity he's advocating for. How dare someone have an opposing I, worldview? I, I'm not going to sit here and dignify what was supposed to be a debate about Christianity versus secular humanism, which one's better for the world. Yes. With someone who clearly showed up with an agenda that has nothing to do with that. I just like... Someone who refers to trans people as deranged lunatics who will self-terminate if you dare to question them. How am I wrong, Matt? It this guy's not serious and I'm leaving. James, if you want to refund, you Well, let me good know. day, sir. There you have it. Rage quitting because this atheist finally finds a guy who is willing to take the logical conclusion of his beliefs and make him own up to them. Now, I heard Trent Horn talk about this debate, and he had some great things to say about it. I highly encourage you to check it out. However, his takeaway was that uh, Andrew Wilson was giving kind of a Pascalian, if that's how you would say it, argument that um, if you take uh, atheism at their word, you would be much better off believing in Christianity because of its results, even if it weren't true. And I think that's, that's, that's a very minor point, actually, to the ultimate debate, because I think actually what Andrew Wilson is doing here is something that that other Christians have not done in the past, which is to do this. He is granting the premise of humanism to Matt Dillahunty, and then he is giving the ultimate conclusion of that premise, and then making Matt Dillahunty defend his ideas when we see what they actually lead to. Now again, most Christians in the past just played defense. 
they allowed atheists of the past to attack them and attack their views, and then Christians would get on the defensive and defend why they actually believe what they believe, rather than to analyze the claims of the humanism and how frail and empty they are. By the way, humanists like Matt Dillahunty might even intuitively know how frail and thin their arguments actually are, and that's why they have to go on the offensive, and that's why they have to attack. Now, I'm good with the offensive if you've got the goods. Uh, to be able to back it up. And Andrew Wilson does here. He makes Matt Dillahunty answer for his ridiculous worldview, and Matt Dillahunty refuses, I think, because he can't. I've heard Matt on a couple of different occasions, and I have to be honest with you, I've been thoroughly unimpressed. Now, I know you're going to say that's because you're a Christian, but simply, this is the kind of thing that ultimately we get whether he retreats or not. We get intellectual retreats rather than actually dignifying the, the subject matter with the kind of dignity it deserves. So forgive Andrew Wilson for not giving the kind of dignity to Matt Dillahunty that he thinks he deserves, you know, especially after Matt Dillahunty comes out and says, I don't really know anything about this guy and haven't researched him at all. He never took it seriously in the first place, and he was there to pontificate and pretend he was some kind of moral better and that he had the intellectual prowess to enter into the ring with Andrew Wilson. When he found out he didn't, he ran away. Now, if you're not a Christian, I know you're probably going to argue with everything that I just said there, and that's fine. But I hope you can find some place in your heart to admit that atheists of the past really were just dog and pony shows. And really, they were just a pony show with just one trick, and that was to blast and browbeat Christians as dumb and superstitious. Now, I'm thankful for modern atheists like Alex O'Connor, the cosmic skeptic, because He's a far cry from those atheists of old. He doesn't have the bite in that atheism did in the past. And frankly, atheism really can't stand without it. Now that strong Christians are coming onto the scene to, to beat back the culture-shifting leftism of our time, we're realizing something I hope every Christian hears me loud and clear on. Defense was played simply out of ease. It's not loving and it's not true. And the Christian who leans into social liberalism and then is applauded isn't doing anything to fight conservatism. Rather, he's just standing against his own faith in order to win approval points. Why would he do something like that? Because weakness comes natural to us all. It's the easiest thing that we can possibly do to actually stand up and defend your ideas and go beyond defending your ideas, but attacking the ideas that deserve to be attacked takes real strength and courage, something we don't see very often. It won't always get you likes, too, on social media. That's why very many narcissistic, self-obsessed Christian leaders won't go on the offensive. As a result, we have a coddled generation of Christians who have weak arguments and don't know how to really stand for their faith. But more and more Christians are starting to realize this and are waking up. They're realizing true love speaks the truth. In fact, it may be one of the most radical acts of benevolence in a world that will applaud you for lying. True love tells the truth. It's especially needed at a time where weak-willed Christian leaders have a narcissistic desire to get attention more so than to tell the truth. For those passive players, I can only hope that a more offensive version of Christianity grips their hearts and wins the day because we need it for our culture. And my advice is to simply, for all of us, don't go for the appearance of good. Go for the reality of goodness because that's what will change the world. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and to go with God.